right. Hello again, this is Ben Hitchcock Cross talking to you today, and I guess for me the summer starts tomorrow. Um, let's say everybody's will be on their official trips and doing all their official summer activities, uh, leaving yours truly to um, farm. <laughs> I guess it's the best word, play farm. I don't know what you want to put it, um, but that's I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I can also tell you um, that, you know, we're shifting seasons here in another aspect as well. Um, let's say that the state of Wisconsin has come down upon this channel like a ton of bricks. Hmm, thanks for asking how. Um, we've got a couple of things. So the Department of Corrections has not been happy um, with the NOVAC coverage and particularly um, the secretary. Um, we can also say that uh, we've gotten several complaints from people who appeared in there. Um, I guess they didn't like how that, uh, how they appeared in that. And I, I just don't, for the record here, I want to be clear, I don't understand how a public official who is being paid to appear in public and who is working uh, as a public official and taking the public's money could object in any way to having their actions uh, be put on camera when they're describing their public work, be put on camera and up for everybody to see. Every, I mean, that should all public officials should be on camera all the time. Um, how else do we democratically scrutinize them? And that that is ultimately what um, an attack on free speech is ultimately an attack on democratic scrutiny here. Um, that's my word for it. If you got a better, I love scrutiny. I just think that's a, if you can get that in there, the screw and the tinny and this, you guys have great sounds to play with. And that's what I like to do. So, um, uh, that, that we'll see how that one plays out, particularly for them. I, I think that ultimately we're going to have a lot of the Streisand effect here, um, which is all goes to, um, I guess the, the broader point of this story here and this is I'm just going to give credit where credit is due. Um, uh, there's a great attorney out there. His name is William Sultan. Um, he I'm working with him on some matters here. Uh, he's working with Debbie Keither. Um, and as much as I joke with him about it, she chose him and she made a really good choice. Um, as if Debbie Keither could have another attorney. <laughs> um, it is funny for a lot of different reasons, and I hope you all appreciate why, and it just cracks me up. Um, yeah. So, back to credit where credit was due. He uh, suggested to us that when somebody bullies you, the thing to do is not to hide your head uh, and go put it under the covers. The thing to do is to go confront that bully and do it publicly, because um, that's what they can't handle. So that is what we're going to start to do here is to confront some bullies. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll get on to that. Um, we've, we are um, dealing with the fact that the state of Wisconsin, that's the Department of Workforce Development, uh, is actively, and I think we've got that pretty clear now, um, preventing us from having recordings um, of them. Uh, they are not refusing to appear. They are refusing to appear on camera. They are postponing hearings. They are doing almost everything that they can um, to um, keep videos off of this channel. We've got, I, I think they don't understand that we've got hundreds of hours of their videos, and I think we're just going to have to start showing them because uh, that's what they can't handle. Now, I think you're going to see a lot of attorneys who aren't me, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's nothing like compare for contrasting. And then again, for contrast and comparison, something good too. So um, that is that one. Um, we are Debbie Keither in ALJ uh, is suing Debbie Keither, the Cross Law Firm, and yours truly um, because it didn't like this judge didn't like uh, what we had to say about uh, him on uh, this channel. So. Again, I think the Streisand effect is probably the, the likeliest outcome. We're, believe me, we're going to get into all this. And then we've got, you know, letters upon letters here um, 
from the Department of Corrections with Tony Evers letterhead on it that are all threatening uh, me, my family, <clears throat> my law license, um, suggesting that I use drugs, that I am a um, insane person, that I have psychopathy. I don't know if that's different than being insane. Um, stating several times that my career is on the line, um, accusing me of felonies. All of these things. Why? That's a really good question. Because I discussed a public official on YouTube. Um, that's Lieutenant Miller here. Um, and we'll talk about that. I have observed that despite your failure to find time, so there, well, just for some context here, there is an argument that they are saying that I didn't provide them with discovery. Well, I am saying that they didn't provide me with discovery. Here's a small difference. I didn't immediately send them letters saying that they were insane. Uh, and then just send six or seven in a row. And I certainly didn't do it after getting a bounce back notice saying that somebody was on vacation because that would be kind of uh, above and beyond uh, what we expect from lawyers. Uh, okay, so I have observed that despite your failure to find time to respond to Discover, you have found time to create and upload YouTube content pertaining to this case including contents that defames, notice that word there, defames, Lieutenant Miller. Your treatment of Miss Miller is regrettable. Miss Miller is hardworking, innocent public servant. I see that attorney William F. Sultan, oh, is representing you in a defamation accident brought by Mr. Furman that stems from another other YouTube content that you have created and uploaded. Perhaps you might seek a Sultan's counsel Regarding, she spells it wrong. It's not Sutton, but you know, people do that. Regarding your statements that malign Miss Miller. Oh, there's a little footnote. I love footnotes. See that, Joker? Footnote. Let's read it. For that matter, your YouTube content also maligns other current and former public servants. Yikes. Hey, let's, we're just going to do it. Hold on one sec. Let's just do it, right? Let's just look at the bully right in the eye and because they watch the show. So we might as well do that. Um, okay. So here we've got a May 21st letter. Uh, I think there's a May 23rd letter. Um, May 20th letter. I think they wanted, yeah, May 20th. Okay, so this is this is what they said. And so just for example, let's just say, um, okay. it's just kind of hard. Here's, Here's one where she's saying at the bottom that I noticed that you've lost a bunch of cases and you're going to lose this one. Now, that's, I think that's a perfectly fine comment to sit, to make. To say that I think you're like a terrible lawyer and you're probably going to lose this case. That, I think, is perfectly fair. Okay? Now, um, I think what's not fair is to threaten somebody's law license in conjunction with statements about how you don't like they're making, uh, they are maligning public officials. That, I think, is uh, the problem there. Um, here, for example, is a great one. This is from May 25th. It would seem that if you have time to create content for your YouTube viewers, you should probably be able to find time to respond to the outstanding discovery in this case. Perfectly fine. The statutes and rules of our state require participation in the discovery process. Absolutely true. They do not require the creation of YouTube content. Okay, got it. I mean, I, it's an interesting point. I don't know why one attorney would be sending that to another. But I think the point here is we follow it up with this. Your law license is on the line and compliance with your obligations as an attorney should be prioritized. Now, where did we go to your law license is on the line here? <clears throat> That's uh, It's a bit disturbing. 
let's, I think we'll get, I really just pointed these. I, this really kind of put me through a tailspin here. I did not read these all at once. Um, you know, and as the attorney here, you don't like yourself to get really get bullied. I'm just going to read the letter because I think that's, you know, I organize my thoughts. And here you can see me just getting flustered just looking at these things. Um, and as I have often told, and I think that this brings up a subject here that we often um, have to understand. Uh, this may be the highlight of the whole show at 10 minutes and 25 seconds here. It's simply this. Um, an attorney is an agent. And that's something that these this Department of Corrections attorney didn't understand. And I'm sorry if I'm not explaining it to you, correct, but this is, they're mad because I'm on YouTube and they send me about five letters within the course of a week uh, that threaten pretty dire consequences for me and specifically my, and also my family. Um, you know, you should think about your family before you post on YouTube is kind of the message that I'm getting here because you know, you could be ruined. So, which again, um, coming from a state actor with Tony Evers' na uh, name on the letterhead is, is pretty troubling. But here we go. So the attorney's names here that we're talking about are um, Andrea Olmanson and Michelle Zaccard. Okay, they are, we know Michelle Zaccard from other DOC stuff. Uh, Andrea Olmanson is, uh, has, was brought on to this particular case, DOC case, and has escalated things uh, to a level that uh, I have not seen before. Um, but that's where we're at with that. <clears throat> this letter, Dear Andrea and Michelle, this letter is in response to your many letters generally and your June 21st letter specifically. One thing that is amazing about this universe is that many beings perceive and respond differently to the same information. From time to time, beings are unable to resolve the, their different perceptions and responses with other beings. Much of the time, these differences pass without comment. Occasionally, these disputes are vital enough to the parties that they bring their disputes before the government to decide which perspective should prevail. You are perfectly free to believe your interpretation of the evidence before you. My client will also make use of that freedom. Many of your discovery letters, and especially the one of June 21st, follows the following formula. You say X, but I say Y. Therefore, you are a liar and need to retract your statement. This, the, this use of this formulation makes one question whether the state of Wisconsin understands that its citizens are allowed to disagree with the state of Wisconsin and form their own opinions. Many people feel that disagreeing with the government and forming one's own opinions is freedom. Some of these people are on the Supreme Court. Moreover, my client can communicate her beliefs to a public audience without interference designed to deter First Amendment activity in the future from state actors. So, we've had enough of it. To prevail on a First Amendment retaliation claim, a plaintiff must ultimately show one, these are what we call, remember, the elements of the claim here. Um, and it's always useful to just start from that to say, hey, let's check off the boxes because um, that's ultimately what we're doing. And a demand letter is saying, we think you're liable because. To prevail on a First Amendment claim, you must show that she engaged in pro uh, activity protected by the First Amendment. Now, that's going to, immediate question in my mind is, what is activity protected by the First Amendment? I think I, I'm going to tell you later. I just have a feeling. Number two, she suffered a deprivation that would likely deter First Amendment activity in the future. Now, this is something I thought was fascinating here. Um, and I've learned a lot more about this in the last couple of days. Generally speaking, there are three kinds, one, two, three kinds of uh, First Amendment claims recognized by the federal courts. Number one 
prisoner First Amendment litigation. Um, fascinating. They're all sort of in the fir- framework, and they all s- or originate uh, in the First Amendment. But uh, if you don't know, and we haven't discussed this very much here on this channel, they're basically there's separate laws for prisoners, uh, and again, and sort of different frameworks for prisoners. And that is largely because prisoners are automatically poor, so you can't charge them a fee to go into the courts, and they got nothing but time on their hands, so they will file things. And a lot of there's, I mean, there's reason why there's such a thing as a prison lawyer. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good. I have heard, but can't confirm, that something like 40% of all federal litigation is from prisoners, um, which that's astounding, if true. Okay. Number, uh, moving on. <clears throat> the First Amendment activity was at least a quote a motivating factor in the defendant's decision to take the retaliatory action. And thanks for reminding me there. That again, there's three kinds. That's prisoner. Number two, we've talked about here is um, First Amendment retaliation in the workplace. Okay. And generally speaking, if the word First Amendment and retaliation are going together, uh, that is going to indicate that this is an employment matter. Okay. There are actually quite a few of those kind of cases out there. And I think the reason for it is just is simply this. A, when you are terminated from a federal position, especially for your comments, you're more, there's a lot of damages that are there at stake. Okay, And we've talked about this. There's been a lot of discussion on this. When should you go pro se? When should you not go pro se? Uh, and, and this is sort of the third category here is the principle of the matter. Okay, we went over the Megan Fox one. I think I would like to do a lot more on that one. But you saw her basically her fees were uh, attorney her her damages ultimately were attorneys fees and a what she call it a uh, Olive Garden settlement something like that right and a, and a good meal and you know I think that's okay um, no I don't want to put it that way I'm just saying that that's it, it's fair to recognize and I think that that. Um, your damages and your more often what you are going to be looking for, and we can get into because of qualified immunity, is injunctive relief. Again, so that's just to be clear, you're asking the court to say, hey, they got to knock off making us dox ourselves or say what our names are in front, and they have to pay our fees, Okay. Qualified immunity and Monel, we're going to skip all that for right now, but that's sort of the three categories, okay? And then three is causation. The First Amendment activity was at least a motivating factor, okay? Now, all of my sites in here are from the Seventh Circuit. So that's Woodruff v. Mason, Massey v. Johnson. Massey is actually a really good case on that. Uh, Bridges v. Gilbert. Bridges v. Gilbert, um, just as like a as a research tip here, there will fairly often be these cases that um, are groundbreaking and sort of you know shatter the 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 preconceived notion. Everything else is coming after that. Sometimes those are great to read in and of themselves. You get a lot of good understanding of what is the reasoning behind uh, those decisions. Okay, a if I don't have a lot of time on my hands or if I'm trying to get a better synopsis, very often it's better to get a case that's five, ten years down the road when they're talking about these things. <coughs> and they'll have all the citations and they'll basically have done all the work for you. And everything's more digested and they've got more case law down there and here's what these guys really meant. And sometimes that, frequently even, I'd say that's more helpful. Uh, for sure. I don't know why we're doing this old-fashioned. I just printed it out. So here we go. First, let us examine whether the uh, plaintiff engaged in activity protected by the First Amendment. Now, this is important. To be protected by the First Amendment, speech must focus on public concern. And I, I feel really weird and shaky about that. And the only comment that I want to make on it is simply this. 
the best Seventh Circuit law that I've found is going to quote the state of St. Paul, uh, Minnesota, RAV, R-A-V, state of St. Paul, Minnesota. I don't know what that means, but whatever. So there is a concurring decision by Stevens, who is many, not many people's favorite um, justice, but hey. Um, and he, this is what the Seventh Circuit is then quoting, and it, which is a concurring opinion, meaning that there's, you know, enough votes to win. Somebody writes the sort of official or a decision, could be not even, you know, binding or the per curiam. What the heck is it? I messed that up. There is a kind of decision where it's not a majority decision, uh, but it's in the winning side, okay? Stevens comes on and joins that, it concurs, and somebody's citing that concurrence, which again isn't really the law, but now then becomes the law in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Illinois because the Seventh Circuit has cited that. A little tricky, but that's how it is. Okay, so, sorry, all that in this quote from Stevens is this. Speech about public officials or manners of public concern receives greater protection than speech about other topics. Now, when I hear that, I think, hey, well, all topics are covered by free speech, but some more so than others. What do we have, a sliding scale there? Apparently we do. Um, and it's one of those things like pornography, you know them when you see it whatever that means, but um, speech about public officials, what I'm saying is we don't know what, where the line is, but we know that public speech is more protected than not public speech. And there's been, there's a, a fascinating um, First Amendment prisoner case, and the jail is letting some of the prisoners wear rosaries, and the you know, the, some of the prisoners who want to wear crosses, they don't allow that for, you know, safety reasons or whatever. And that is held to be a um, violation of their religious rights, but not of their First Amendment rights because the wearing of this thing, the way that they argued it, wasn't that they wanted to show it off to the world. They wanted to have it in the same way that people have a rosary, which is, a, you know, uh, performative, I guess I would say. So you can see how easily a concurring decision can end up having real-world effects for real-world people. Okay. Your letter of March 27th, May 20th, May 21st, May 23rd, June 3rd, uh, and June 3rd all mentioned my client's activity on YouTube channel Deliberate Indifference Wisconsin and is particularly focused on three public officials, Kevin Carr, Mac DeFesahaya, and Lieutenant Miller. You allege that the plaintiff defamed public officials. For example, on May 22nd, you sent the plaintiff the following. I have observed that despite your failure to find time to respond to discovery, you have found time to create and upload. We did read that before. Content pertaining to this case, including content that defamed Lieutenant Miller. Your treatment of Miss Miller is regrettable. Miss Miller is a hardworking, innocent public servant. And you know what? Just this is me saying this. She's also subject to democratic scrutiny, just like um, the vast majority. There is a clear line, and I want to be clear, between sort of public public servants and like the janitor, who are clocking in and really doing a nine to five job and are really no way uh, a part of the policy of the state of Wisconsin. Now, there's a great appeals court case that says. Wisconsin that says a police officer is a public officer uh, in the sense that they are perceived, they can be perceived to create policy. For example, they've got discretion to arrest people on behalf of the state of Wisconsin. So that's pretty big power. Now, a lieutenant at a jail, or it could even be a captain, I don't know, at a jail has some significant power over the lives of a great number of the citizens of the state of Wisconsin and exercises discretion on behalf of the state of Wisconsin for inmates, people in her care. So this, the question is, do those people perceive her as acting on behalf of the state of Wisconsin, right? And th this, the key thing there is, is she making sort of decisions that are a using state power that are affecting people's lives. That's the best way I can say it, as opposed to just pushing a bro. 
Well, it's an analogy, of course. That's not the line. But that's the question here. And so what do you think? Is a lieutenant in the Department of Corrections, a white shirt, if you will, is that person a, uh, a supervisor? Is that person a public official? Several of your letters referred to a office, an Office of Lawyer Regulation complaint filed by Magda Fessahaya for comments made on YouTube about her on behalf of Warden Novak. Ms. Fessahaya, who is now employed by the state of Wisconsin, University of Milwaukee, freely admits that all of the comments concern her public employment. She just wants the Office of Lawyer Regulation to stifle free speech. And I, look... I'll be the first to remind, uh, admit that lawyers as agents licensed by the state of Wisconsin do not have full free speech rights, okay? Ben Hitchcock Cross does have full fees, free speech rights, and it's difficult to understand when Ben Hitchcock Cross is Ben Hitchcock Cross regular Joe or Ben Hitchcock regular Ben or Ben Hitchcock Cross attorney. Okay, but we'll just assume here for the sake of discussion that it's Ben Hitchcock Cross attorney. Okay, meaning that I am absolutely going to be covered about rules of I can't make gratuitous personality. I can't, um, there's limits on certain things that I can say, uh, etc. I guess there is a absolute limit on I'm not allowed to harass people. Um, but I'm absolutely am able to uh, discuss vital issues of public importance in the public record all day long. And just because it's controversial does not mean that it is unethical or even indeed harassment. And I think that that's the really what I think part of the problem is here is that uh, it's ultimately, and I, I hate to use this word here, but um, sorry. And this, this is the one thing I want to be clear. When Ben Hitchcock Cross is talking, and this I guess will come up in a second here, so why don't we just let it happen? But when the attorney is agent, though, I just want to be clear that the client is the one that's speaking through the attorney. And that's also why it's absolutely legit legitimate for there to be certain restrictions on the attorney's speech when it's on behalf of the client, both to protect the client and to protect the public, no doubt about it. Okay. Now, other letters refer to a defamation suit against Dr. Keither and her attorney for comments made on Dr. Uh, Keither's behalf about Judge Calvin Furman when Judge Furman was Deputy Superintendent for Public Schools or an Administrative Law Judge. Your letter references comments on matters of public concern include J Judge Furman's public conduct and employment. Next, let us examine whether your letters would likely deter First Amendment activity in the future. The Seventh Circuit applies an objective test whether the alleged conduct by the defendants would likely deter a person of ordinary firmness from continuing to engage in protected activity. It is therefore relevant if the plaintiff continued to boast about the Department of Correction in the face of the deprivation. What matters is whether a district court would see Andrew's statement as a deprivation. This is from your May 20th letter to the plaintiff. I see that attorney William Sultan is representing you in defamation action brought against you by Mr. Furman. That seems from other YouTube content that you have created and uploaded. Perhaps you might seek attorney Sutton's counsel regarding your statements that malign Ms. Miller. Hey, there is, and I missed a footnote here, so I will apologize, uh, but it is simply this. Andrea's June 21st letter states that her letters were addressed to Ben Hitchcock Cross 
and therefore not to the plaintiff, okay? And that's crucial because she's saying, hey, I'm not liable to the plaintiff. I'm, uh, you know, I didn't say mean things to the plaintiff. I said mean things to you, okay? She's, of course, going to dispute that she said any mean things. So let, let me be clear. I didn't say anything to you, uh, your client. I said something to you, okay? But that position expresses a fundamental misunderstanding of agency. Agent, attorneys are agents for their client. And I say to the uh, appeals court, two different appeals court cases and a statute. So we can feel pretty confident on that subject. All right. Here we go. As I have previously communicated to you, I really don't want to see another attorney dig themselves in deeper than they already are. And I would think attorney Sutton would probably provide you with an accurate and dispassionate advice. For some reason, you were compelled to send another letter the next day following the following. The statutes and rule of our state require participation in the discovery process. They do not require creation of YouTube context. Your law license is on the line. Okay. Then I say, you have not confided in me that you also work for the Office of Lawyer Regulation or are in any way in a position to determine the <coughs> outcome of OLR investigation. <coughs> All right. Many people might think you were claiming to speak for the OLR. So it's in fact a crime, but it's also unethical for an attorney to say, to hint that they have some connection with the district attorney or that they can forecast or even say, you will be guilt found guilty of X. Or the most you could say really is, you could be found, you know, Mr. Smith, you could be found, if you persist in this activity, you could be found liable for, you know, disorderly conduct, okay? That's the most that you could say. It's even, it's not even really cool, in my opinion, to say, that's assault. Now, a regular person, sure, but an attorney, because, again, it could give the um, appearance to a lay person that you are and others, that you are speaking on behalf of an agency that you don't speak on behalf of, and it's not being candid with them. And that, I think, is the ultimately what the problem there is. You can't say, hey, you might um, it'd be a shame if you lost your law license. So, this is from May 23rd. Here's another one. From one member of the bar to another... I am very concerned that a fellow attorney is being so cavalier with his law license. You are already facing a number of OLR complaints. Do you want to make your situation worse? Question mark. Here we go. She keeps going on and says, maybe I should go seek uh, this counseling and says, if you're, if the problem involves substance abuse or mental health, Wisconsin LAP is there for you, <clears throat> which is, Again, I've never um, had anybody say that when they get an email, again, every one of these e these letters, this attorney is getting a response that says, Ben is on vacation. Everyone. And I've never had somebody send me a letter saying that, uh, there's another one that says that, you know, are you su suffering from psychopathy? or that you continue to post on YouTube indicates a form of psychopathy. Um, it's just, uh, even just reading it, it's shocking, but okay. As indicated above, Andrea may say that she was politely pointing out the logical consequences of ongoing contraventions of the rules and law governing the practice of law. Okay. So that's, you know, when confronted with this, um, I certainly... Um, I com have complained to her supervisor about this behavior because other people in my law firm have complained about similar activities 
and I raised that to the boss because if this is happening to me, I don't know how she feels that she can talk to other people like this. Um, and I'm, <clears throat> I know and will confess very openly that I'm not explaining this as well as I could, uh, but some of these letters are just like astonishing to the point that I can't read them. But okay. But this is a little different. This Your sentence here, and this is quoting from her, politely pointing out the logical consequence of ongoing contraventions of the rules and laws governing the practice of law. She's saying she's not threatening me. Those weren't threats. But she was merely pointing this out and politely, too. But I say that's a little different from the language of the mafia. Just for example, would it be, would it be a shame? I guess it should, wouldn't it be a shame? If something bad happened to your nice law firm, or family, or you, or your career, you know, hey. Especially when coupled with demands to drop the suit and get off YouTube. A district court judge may find your comments threatening, and that's what really matters. <clears throat> and that's the fact. So... Um, I think we are getting to this point here where um, these gov the state of Wisconsin is just sort of used to having its way where they say shut up and you shut up because it's not nice or I don't know what. Um, but it, these threats against my client's First Amendment rights really need to stop. Um, and so we're going to just start exposing them. And I think that'll be the beginning of the end. Nothing like a little sunshine uh, to disinfect here. So thanks for sticking with us. We'll keep you informed.